this week. God has given us a beautiful day this morning, a beautiful day to, to celebrate Jesus. Uh, I also hope that uh, you've had a, a chance to, uh, to worship a little bit at home, family, uh, with the, the liturgy, the order of worship that, that we send out. Hopefully those are, are helpful to you. Just one note on, on this morning, after the sermon, uh, my family will, uh, will be leading us all in, in singing the song of response, Spirit of the Living God, and also doing the, the doxology together. So um, we'd love for you to join us in singing along uh, at home. So uh, This morning we continue the, the series that we started last week, a new series on just one chapter of the Bible, Acts chapter 2. And uh, we're going to, to dig in to this chapter. And that means that we're going to spend a lot of time on, on details. And one of my goals uh, through this series is just to get you to, to both know this chapter and to love this chapter. I want you to love this chapter and to, to through that, love the God who reveals himself in such amazing ways in this chapter of Acts 2. So last week we started the series by doing just an introduction through through uh, Acts chapter 1, we saw there uh, Jesus' final instructions to his disciples, uh, the ascension, and then the replacement of, of Judas uh, with Matthias. And now we, this morning, we get into Acts 2, and so I ask you to, to turn there, and uh, I, I'm going to really encourage you to have Bibles open as we go through this. We'll be looking at the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2, and it will be helpful if you have your Bibles open. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, this is God's word to his people. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. This is God's word. So let's remember from Acts chapter 1, the, the disciples are, are waiting. That's what Jesus told them to do. He, he told them to, to wait. And they were waiting and, and praying, waiting for this coming of the, the Holy Spirit. The, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. I wonder what that was like. You know, we, we're on, on this side of Pentecost, so we, we look back and, and we kind of think that knowing what Pentecost was like, knowing what that was like to have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but the disciples, they, they weren't sitting there waiting. Well, I wonder when these tongues of fire are going to come. I wonder when there's going to be this wind. I wonder when we're going to speak. They didn't know that. They, they were waiting and, and probably wondering, what, what, what's this going to be like? What's going to happen? What, 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 what's going to feel like? All, all they knew was, was what the Old Testament had said about the, the Holy Spirit, about the Spirit of God coming on, on people, giving them certain abilities and, and usually the, the enabling them to, to prophesy. That's what they knew, but they didn't know what was going to go along with that. They didn't know how it would feel and 
I'm, I'm guessing that they, they even thought, how will we know? How are we really going to know that this was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Now it's been 10 days. 10 days since Jesus left them and went into heaven. They're still in Jerusalem, just like Jesus had, had instructed. They're still waiting. And now it's feast day. Uh, there were three different harvest feasts that, that the Israelites and the Jews celebrated. And, and this second feast was probably the, the biggest of the, the three feasts. And people would come to Jerusalem from all over. And, and, and this feast was, was called the, the Feast of the Harvest or the, the Day of the First Fruits. And you can read about this in uh, Leviticus 23 or in Numbers 28 and in Deuteronomy 16. And, and as the, the, the Feast of the Harvest, the Day of the First Fruits, or it was called the, the Feast of Weeks. And it was seven weeks after the Sabbath of the Passover. Okay, follow that? So think of the Passover time. And the Sabbath, so that would be the Saturday of the Passover time. Now, from that Sabbath, they would count seven weeks. Now, all right, students, you're still doing math, right? So let's figure that out. How many days would that be? If you have seven weeks, that would be 49 days, right? And so after 49 days... Now, the, the day after that, so now it's the day after Sabbath, so now it's the first day of the week, it's Sunday, which is now the 50th day, right? Following me? The, the 50th day is when they would celebrate and, and bring their offerings of the first fruits of the harvest. On the 50th day, and that's why this festival, this feast, became called the Feast of Pentecost. That just comes from the Greek word for 50. So it's the, the day of Pentecost. And they're all coming to Jerusalem. Now, there's, there's different um, ideas on why God would choose this day, the Feast of Pentecost, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And some tie it in with the idea of harvest. And that, that could be. There are many commentators, especially older commentators, who, uh, who believe that, that this is tied in with the idea, the, the Jewish idea, that the giving of the law at Sinai happened 50 days after the Exodus, after the Passover feast in Egypt. And... and so there's, there's some people who tie it in with that. Now, I'm going to go along with John Calvin, who said those probably aren't the main reasons. The main reason, most likely, that, that God in his providence chose that day for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is because this is the day when all kinds of people are coming to Jerusalem from all over the place. And we'll talk about that a bit. But, but here they are. They're, well, they're all gathered together in Jerusalem. And it tells us that, that they were all together in one place. Now, who's the they here? It could be the, the 12 apostles that were just mentioned in, in the last verse of chapter 1. Or it could be the 120 that were mentioned in verse 15 of chapter 1. I don't know. But, but there is a group of, of Christ followers who have all gathered together, and they're gathered together waiting on this feast day. They're still waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly, three things happen. A sound, a sight, and significant speech. There, there's a sound, it is a, a sound of a violent wind. Notice that it doesn't say a, a violent wind happened, but it is the sound of a violent wind. There is a sight, it's a sight of, of tongues of fire. And then there's significant speech. There's the, the speaking in tongues enabled by the Holy Spirit. All three of these things were signs. 
Signs of the Holy Spirit. They were, they were signs of the disciples. Remember, they're, they're probably wondering, how will we know? And so God gave them these three signs for them to know that, that this was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work. Now, how were these three things signs of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's, let's think about them. First, there was the, the sound of wind. Wind was, was connected to the, the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. In fact, the, the Hebrew word for, for wind, one of the Hebrew words for wind, is the same Hebrew word for spirit, ruach. And they, they mean this, the same thing. So there was this, this connection. And the, the Greek word for, for wind, in fact, the Greek word that's used here in verse 2 for this violent wind is connected with the, the Greek word for spirit. And so when, when they thought, as, as Jewish people, when they thought of wind, there was some connection there with, with the work of the Spirit. And so here, in a way, the disciples are hearing, remember the, the, the sound is, is, is in the house, it's still in the house, they are hearing the Holy Spirit at work. And it says that the sound came from heaven. Now that could mean that, that the sound came from the sky, but is there some significance to that? Well, let's think about what just happened in chapter 1. Verses 9 through 11. Remember what, what we saw there? Jesus' ascension. And in those three verses, verses 9 through 11 of chapter 1, four times we have the word for, for heaven or for sky, the same word that we see here. Where did Jesus go when he ascended? Into heaven. Now, but I, I don't understand that, but, but that's the word that's, that's given. He went into heaven or into the sky. Where does the sound come from? The same place where Jesus went. It, it, it's as if we have this picture. Jesus goes into the heavens. And now that Jesus has gone into the heavens, he sends his spirit who comes from the heavens, the very same place where Jesus went. Jesus is sending his spirit. They heard this sound. And they also saw a, a sight. They saw the, the tongues of fire. Fire was also a really important Old Testament image for the presence of God. Just think of, of some of the, the stories, some of the accounts that we have in the Old Testament. Moses, at the burning bush, representing the presence of God. Remember the, the Israelites going through the wilderness? How were they led at nighttime? A pillar of fire. The presence of God in fire. When they got to Mount Sinai, the, the mountain was, the, the people could see on the mountain fire, the presence of God represented in fire. We see throughout the, the prophets the, the idea of the presence of God, the judgment of God, he's a consuming fire. Fire was this image for the presence of God. And, and here is the Spirit of God. He is the presence of God in his people. The fire that, that they saw would have reminded them of, of the presence of God, exactly who the Spirit was. Now, it, it says there that there were tongues of fire, tongues that, that looked like fire. Now, is, is that significant, that it, it uses that word tongue? A lot of commentators would say, no, that's, there's no significance there. I'm in the minority here, but I believe that there is significance to this, to this word, the word tongues. It, it's the exact same word, it's the word glosa, a little Greek for you here, glosa. Uh, easy one to say, kids, you can say that at home, glosa. And, and it, it means tongue, it, it's actually the same word that's used in uh, verse 4, where it talks about them speaking in other tongues. This word glosa is only ever used in two, uh, two ways to refer to two different things. 
just like in English, it can refer to the tongue. I'm not going to show you mine, but it can refer to the, the actual tongue, the, the organ in your mouth that you use to talk, that you use to, to swallow, that, that thing in your mouth, the tongue. That's plosa. But it can also be used to talk about other languages, other tongues, just like we, we use that in, in English. There is no other way that the, that the Bible, the New Testament, ever uses that word plosa. So there's no time that, that's, that the, the Bible ever talks about or uses that word tongue to talk about just a, a little flame or, or a little bit of, of, of anything, really. It's only about the tongue or languages. And it seems like, like Luke is, is trying to, to make this connection. They are seeing not just fire, but they are seeing tongues that look like fire. The Holy Spirit is connected with the tongue and was, was giving them a sign that, that when the Holy Spirit comes, it will affect their speech. It will affect their tongues in mighty ways. And it will affect their tongues so that they will be able to speak in other tongues. And we, we see here in, in verse 3 that these tongues of fire separated and rested on each of them. Don't miss this. This, this is so great. See, in, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would, would work by, by coming on a specific person for a specific task for a specific time. Not all believers received the, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit, he would come and, and, and be with one person for a specific time, and then sometimes would be taken away when that person's task was done. But here, here, the, the, the flame, the, the tongue of fire is resting on each one of them. Not just one or two, but each one of those believers, the Holy Spirit comes on. And, and it says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. I love that. Just like, it's the same word, just like the, the house was filled with the sound of the violent wind. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just given a little piece of the Holy Spirit, but filled. And this is true for all believers today. You are given the Holy Spirit, not just given a little piece of the Holy Spirit, not just a little taste here or there of the Holy Spirit. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that leads to the third sign. We, there was sound, there was sight, and now there's significant speech. They began to, to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them, it says in verse 4. Now, as I mentioned before, other tongues, it simply means other languages. They were speaking in other languages that they had not learned. Think about this. The, so the, the Jerusalem is filled with people. And it's filled with people who, there, there were Jews who had lived in, in other places throughout the world and who had returned to Jerusalem and, and were now living in Jerusalem. And there's a lot of people from all over the world who have just traveled to Jerusalem for the, the Feast of Pentecost. And all of those people are amazed they're amazed because they're hearing the apostles speak in their own native language, wherever they were from. That's my home, my home tongue. I know that language. So one of the things that we see here is, is when it's talking about speaking in tongues, it's not talking about unintelligible babbling. This is not some kind of spiritual, heavenly language. This is, these are real languages that people spoke. Except that the apostles had never learned these languages. 
That's why the, the people say, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Now, the Galileans had a, a very noticeable accent. Uh, you might remember from the, the story of Peter when he when Peter denied Jesus and the, the servants that, that approached him and talked to him, they, they pointed out and said, well, you, you must be a Galilean. We can tell by your accent. And, and there are some sources that, that say they had a very unique accent. Um, and I saw a couple of places where it says they, they would swallow their guttles. I have no idea what that means. My kids said, better Google it. Maybe I should Google it and see what that means. They swallow their guttles. But, but there's something very unique about their, about their accent. And so all the people could hear them talk and say, wait a second, they... They're all Galileans. They're, they're all Galileans. They're not from, from my hometown. They're not from that place and that place and that place. They're all from Galilee. Now, another thing that goes along with that, as Galileans, the Galileans were, were known, and this is maybe partly because of their accent, they were known as sort of the, the backwoods, uneducated folk. And you can probably think of, of some accents in English that, that, that we hear that we might think of those, those people who talk like that are, are the uneducated, simple people. You know, if, if you talk in a British accent, that makes you sound smart. If you talk in some of these other accents, and people are like, man, they don't know much. And I'm not going to tell you what those accents are because some of you have them. Uh, I don't want to offend you, but that, that, was, that was the Galileans. They had this accent that people said, they're just not smart. They're uneducated people. And the Jews, those who are in Jerusalem, are saying, aren't these people all Galileans who are speaking our languages? How can they be speaking in, in our native dialect? Now, if they were Judean, if they were from Jerusalem, then we could understand that maybe they've learned these languages. But they're the uneducated folk from up north. How is this possible? So this was, was a sign. It was a sign that this was something absolutely supernatural, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And we have then again the the following verses there, and, uh, especially in verses 9 and uh, 9 through 11, this whole list of, of the places where people were from and, and the, the languages that, that some of them, um, that they, they spoke. They came from all over the place. In fact, verse 5 says that there were Jews in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. Now, obviously, that's written from, from the perspective of the first century, not meant to be taken Literally, as we understand it, but there were people from all over the place. And they were all hearing the apostles speak in their native tongue. So, what's going on here? Why? Why, why would this be the sign? Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's a really interesting word in verse six, and yes, we're gonna we're gonna get into a little bit more in Greek here. So stick with me, okay? Look at verse six, and, and if you're using the NIV, you'll see the word bewilderment. You see that? Well, that that word in Greek, if you take the word apart, it, it literally means to pour together with, okay? Can you get this, this picture? If you take two liquid substances and you, you pour them together with each other, they just kind of, especially if, if you're pouring like two different colored paints together, they just kind of get confused, right? That's the sense of this word. It's, it's that idea of confusion. Now, this word in Greek is only used 17 times in the Greek Old Testament, through the, the whole Old Testament, it's only used 17 times, so it's not a, a, a word that's used a lot, but of those 17 times, two of those times for this word 
is found in Genesis 11. Stick with me here, okay? What's going on in Genesis 11? Anyone remember? It's the account of the Tower of Babel. Okay, you know that story? The people had, had one language, common speech, and they wanted to make a name for themselves. They were going to settle down in one place and, and make a great city, and they were going to build this great tower, all to, to make a name for themselves. They were going to be great. And the Lord said, this is what he says in, in Genesis 11, verse 7, Come, let us go down and confuse, that's that word, confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. And then it goes on to say, so the Lord, listen to this, so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel. Because the Lord confused, same word, confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. You see what's going on here in Acts chapter 2? It is the undoing. It is the beginning of the reversal of Babel. Here we, we have the, the Jews who have been scattered throughout the known world. Many of them who have been scattered because of the exile. There's a lot of other factors that have scattered them. And these Jews had come back to Jerusalem. Some of them had, had returned to, to live there, and, and some were, were just coming back for, for the Feast of Pentecost. But the scattered had been brought back. And one of the signs of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is working, is that language is no longer a barrier. Remember in chapter 1, we saw that Jesus had said to his to the apostles that they would be his witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this is just the first sign that that's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to work. He's going to build his church, and it will not be just in Jerusalem. It will not be just in one place. It will be to the ends of the earth. It will not be limited just to the Jews or just to one language. It will be for all people. Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ for every people, every tribe, every nation, every language. That's the promise for the church. You see this in the book of Revelation, where it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Babel, undone! This is so important for, for us to remember, too, in our, in our day and age, Babel is, is, is being reversed, it's being undone. We, we must never have any sense of, of ethnic superiority. We must never think that, that, that it's our nation that's really important, that our nation is the kingdom of God. Because then we are returning to Babel. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit has reversed that. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the church, every nation, every people, and every language. Now let me, let me just say that I, I do not believe that, that these signs that, that we see here in Acts 2 are supposed to be continual signs of the work of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just like we, we don't expect when, when the Holy Spirit's at work, we don't expect to hear wind, we don't expect to see tongues of fire. I don't think we should expect to, to hear people speaking in languages that they have never learned. Now, it doesn't mean that God couldn't do that. He certainly can, but we shouldn't expect it. 
These were specific signs for a specific and very important time in history, an important event in the story of redemption. But did you notice, in verse 11, did you notice what it was that the people heard in their own language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. This is one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He leads us to praise our God. He opens our lips. He redeems our tongues so that we declare the wonders of God. I don't know exactly what that, that was like on that, that day of Pentecost. My guess is that, that they were declaring the wonders of God using the words from the Psalms in all these different languages, but I don't know. But one of the things that we see throughout the rest of the book of Acts is that, that the apostles, as they were declaring the wonders of God, they were making it clear that the greatest wonder of God was the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the, the center point of all of the wonders of God. The greatest wonder that God has ever performed is salvation, redemption, and, and rescue for his people through, through, the, through Jesus, through his atoning sacrifice, his atoning death, and through his victorious resurrection. And those are the wonders that we must declare as those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, we are His witnesses. We have been given the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God living in us. And when He lives in us, He then equips us to be His witnesses, witnesses of the death and resurrection of Jesus. How are you doing that? We're, we're in a time of quarantine. We can't be together with others like we want. Does that mean that we are not witnesses right now? How can we use even this time right now to be witnesses to others of the wonders of God? In what ways can, can you reach out to your neighbors to yet, yes, to, to serve them, but also to speak to them? Of what God has done through Jesus Christ. And as we do that, don't miss the reaction of the people in Acts 2. See, some were amazed and perplexed and said, what does this mean? But some says in verse 13, some over made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Look at that. There, there was the, the sound of the wind there was the sight of, of the tongues of fire. There was the significant speech. All of those things pointing to something supernatural, pointing to something truly special going on. And with all of those signs, there were still some who said, these guys are simply sloshed on wine. There will always be the reaction for some as we declare the wonders of God. So we are his witnesses, but it's the Holy Spirit who opens the hearts for people to receive. There will always be those who say, it's not enough evidence. God didn't give enough signs of his, of his existence, of his presence. There's not enough evidence of, of Jesus Christ and, and of who he is. Because of sin, we are all blinded to those signs, to, to all the evidence that, that Jesus, that, that God gives of, of who he is and of who Jesus is. We're blinded to that. We're completely dependent, completely dependent on the work, the revival of the Holy Spirit. That the, the Holy Spirit would, would open our eyes to see who God is and to see the wonders he has done. When you think of how amazing it is that God, who, who has to do this work through the Holy Spirit, has chosen to use you and me to 
be his witnesses. And it's through our declaring the wonders of God that he works by his Holy Spirit to change the hearts and to open eyes from unbelief. You and me as uneducated and simple as the Galileans, as we might be, he's using us, his people. Not because we're so great, but because he has poured out his Holy Spirit and filled us we do thank you and praise you for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We are blind and deaf and in fact dead apart from the Holy Spirit's work. So Lord, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to awaken us, to open our eyes. And so help us, Lord, to truly be witnesses who you are, of all your wonders. Work in us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So our song of response that we'll leave you with, we do encourage you to, to join us in singing the Spirit of the Living God. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace.